Good morning, students, and welcome back to Language Arts. Uh, here we are at Wednesday already. It's amazing how fast these weeks at home go. Um, and this will actually be our your last recorded lesson for this week. You'll have today's conclusion of The Pearl by John Steinbeck. We'll finish the book, and then you will have tomorrow um, work time for preparation for a discussion on Friday. How do we prepare for this discussion? Well, I'm glad you asked. We are not going to have a test per se, but we will have a discussion similar to the ones we've had in the past. And your task starting tonight and then tomorrow during your work time for my class, you will have the opportunity to make two questions of each level. That's two level one questions, which are black and white, uh, can be proven by pointing to textual evidence. Uh, two of those questions. Then two level two questions, think level questions, that is ones that require interpretation and opinion on the side of the reader. Things that are not obvious, but can still be supported by the text and the reader's own mind and their own opinion. Um, and then two level three questions, and those are connections outside of the text, connect, connecting this book to another book that you've read or connecting this book to a, a part of something that's happened in your life maybe, or something that's happening in the culture right now with this crazy coronavirus time that we find ourselves in. So um, that makes six questions total that you can start generating today and tomorrow during class because we will not have any recorded lesson to watch. So you'll have some time to do that. Then Friday, we will have that grand discussion uh, using the questions that you submit before 11.59 on Thursday. Okay. Um, you had to read th to page 80 uh, for this, uh, for today's reading, so that we are in a place to con con conclude, I can't talk, a place to conclude the story with the last 10 pages. And boy, is it quite a conclusion. Um, I think this will surprise a lot of you in how this thing goes down. Um, at where we, where we left off for you in your reading, uh, they were on the run. They were being hunted by trackers. We talked about how they're acting a lot like animals, where it's kill or be killed. That sort of thinking, fight or flight, is another way that psychologists will put put it, um, what they're experiencing, where they're just in panic mode. They're not being rational. They're not talking to each other. Um, they're not using their their brain in a really intellectual way. It's just survival at this point. You have to run away or you have to be defensive. And so they talk about these trackers um, and how they're being hunted down. And they have to run and run and run. But of course, after a while, you run out of water and they are getting very thirsty. So while there may be some more secretive locations that they could be hiding at this point, they are drawn to this green foliage filled foliage is it like plants lots of plants around um, this green area where there's a trickling stream you should be thinking oh like the garden of eden and how there's there's plants and it's it's beautiful uh, so regardless of what would be the safest option their survival instincts say i see a green place with water and fruit i'm going to go run off there even if that will be one of the more um, one of the more easy places to track for the trackers. That is where we are now. And what do you think is going to happen with these trackers? Is this going to be a nice ending? Um, we'll have to see. So I'm going to start at the bottom of page 80 and pick it up from there. Wanda turned to look at him and she saw his back stiffen. How far? She asked quietly. They will be here by evening, said Kino. He looked up the long, steep, the long, steep chimney of the cleft where the water came down. We must go west, he said, and his eyes searched the, the stone shoulder behind the cleft. And 30 feet up on the gray shoulder, he saw a series of little erosion caves. He slipped off his sandals and clambered up to them, gripping the bare stone with his toes, and he looked into the shallow caves. They were only a few feet deep, wind hollowed scoops but they sloped slightly downward and back kino crawled into the largest one and lay down and knew that one that he could not be seen from the outside 
Quickly he went back to Wana. You must go up there. Perhaps they will not find us there, he said. Without question, she filled her water bottle to the top, and Kino helped her up to the shallow cave and brought up the packages of food and passed them to her. And Wana sat, sat in the cave entrance and watched him. She saw that he did not try to erase their tracks in the sand. Instead, he climbed up the brush cliff beside the water, clawing and tearing at the ferns and wild grape as he went. And when he had climbed a hundred feet to the next bench, he came down again. He looked carefully at the smooth rock shoulder toward the cave to see that there was no trace of passage. And at last he climbed up and crept into the cave beside Wana. So he's being a good guy again, kind of protecting his family, trying to find food for them to eat, foraging through the wilderness in this garden. This seems to be a good moment for them, right? When they go up, he said, we will slip away down to the lowlands again. I am afraid only that the baby may cry. You must see that he does not cry. He will not cry, she said, and she raised the baby's face to her own and looked into his eyes and stared solemnly back at her. He knows, said Wana. Hmm, does the baby know what's going on? I'm not sure, Wana. Now Kino lay in the cave entrance, his chin braced on his crossed arms, and he watched the blue shadow of the mountain move out across brushy desert below until it reached the gulf and the long twilight of the shadow was over the land the trackers were long in coming and though they had trouble with the trail kino as though they had trouble with the trail kino had left it was the dusk when they came at last to the little pool and all three were on foot now for a horse could not climb the last steep slope from above they were thin figures in the evening the two trackers scurried about on the little beach, and they saw Kino's progress up the cliff before they drank. The man with the rifle sat down and rested himself, and the trackers squatted near him. And in the evening the points of their cigarettes glowed and receded, and then Kino could see that they were eating, and the soft murmur of their voices came to him. Then darkness fell, deep and black in the mountain cleft. The animals that used the pool came near and smelled uh, smelled men there and drifted away again into the darkness. He heard a murmur behind him. Juana was whispering, Coyotito. She was begging him to be quiet. Kino heard the baby whimper, and he knew from the muffled sounds that Juana had covered his head with her shawl. This is a bit freaky. They are very close to them right now. The tra that is, the trackers are very close to Wano and Kino, hearing the very words that they're saying, and they, they realize that, oh, the trackers have found my tracks, and it's only a matter of time until they come into these caves, which are just a little bit further up the mountain. Yikes. <clears throat> Down on the beach, a match flared, and in its momentary light, Kino saw the two of the men were sleeping, curled up like dogs, another animal comparison. While the third watched, and he saw the glint of the rifle in the match light, and then he, the match died, but it left a picture on Kino's eyes. He could see it, just how each man was, two sleeping, curled up, and the third squatting in the sand with the rifle between his knees. Kino moved silently back into the cave. Juana's eyes were two sparks reflecting a low star. Kino crawled quietly close to her, and he put his lips near to her cheek. There is a way, he said. But they will kill you. If I get first to the one with the rifle, Kino said, I must get to him first. Then I will be all right. Two are sleeping. So remember, Kino is kind of fantasized about having this rifle when he was looking into the pearl. Now this fantasy could come true, and he thinks this is that everything will be all right if he gets the rifle. It seems a, a rather narrow way to define what is all right. Uh, if you can, you can kind of infer what he's going to do with this rifle after he gets it. Is that all right? Hmm. Let's see. Um, two of them are sleep. Two are sleeping. Her hand crept out from under her shawl and gripped his arm. They will see your white clothes in the starlight. No, he said, and I must go before moonrise. He searched for a soft word and then gave it up. If they kill me, he said, lie quietly. And when they are gone away, go to Laredo. 
Her hand shook a little, holding his wrist. There is no choice, he said. It is the only way. They will find us in the morning. Her voice trembled a little. Go, with God, she said. He peered closely at her, and he could see her large eyes. Who else says this line, go with God? Juan Tomas, when he thinks that Kino's making his bad decisions. Uh, just a little bit ago, we had Juana, who is pleading with him. Let me come with you. Let me come with you. And he eventually relents and says, okay, we'll stick together this time. Now he says, there's no other way. I'm going in. This is different this time. And she says, go with God. Because she doesn't know what else to say to him at this point. Um, he peered closely at her and he could see her large eyes. He, his hand fumbled out and found the baby. And for a moment, his palm lay on Coyotito's head. And then Kino raised his hand and touched Juana's cheek and she held her breath. Against the sky in the cave entrance, Juana could see that Kina was taking off his white clothes, for dirty and ragged though they were, they would show up against the dark night. His own brown skin was a better protection for him. And then she saw how he hooked his amulet neck string about the horn handle of his great knife so that it hung down in front of him and left both hands free. He did not come back to her, for a moment his body was black in the cave entrance, crouched and silent, and then he was gone. What's he going to go do? Emerging from the cave, throwing off his clothes because he blends in more with the, with the environment, taking the advice of Juana, even though he said, oh, I'm fine without, I'm fine wearing these white clothes. And then he actually takes her advice as soon as he's gone. So he does respect her, just not to her face. Um, Juana moved to the entrance and looked out. She peered like an owl from the hole in the mountain, and the baby slept under the blanket on her back. His face turned sideways against her neck and shoulder. She could feel his warm breath against her skin, and Juana whispered her combination of prayer and magic, her Hail Marys and her ancient intercession against the black unhuman things. She did this before, remember, when, when Coyotito is uh, ill. She prays both to the Christian god and to the other gods of her earlier religion. The night seemed a little less dark when she looked out, and to the east there was a lightning in the sky, down near the horizon where the moon would show, and looking down she could see the cigarette of the man on watch. Kino edged like a slow lizard. How many animal metaphors will there be down the smooth rock shoulder he had turned his neck string so that the great knife hung down from his back and could not clash against the stone his he, his spread fingers gripped the mountain and his bare toes found the support through contact and even that his chest lay against the stone so that he would not slip for any sound a rolling pebble or a sigh a little slip of fresh flesh on the rock would rouse the watchers below. Any sound that was not germane to the night would make them alert. But the night was not silent. The little tree frogs that lived near the stream twittered like birds, and the high metallic ringing of the cicadas filled the mountain cleft, and Kino's own music was in his head, the music of the enemy, low and pulsing, nearly asleep. But the song of the family had become as fierce and sharp and feline as the snarl of a female puma. <laughs> man his energy is top notch right now he can feel the the song of his family of this protective impulse that he needs to act upon and he's going to pounce like a puma uh and it's very very um intense is is the only word i can give it the family song was alive now and driving him down on the dark enemy the harsh cicada seemed to take up its melody and the twittering tree tree frogs called little phrases of it and kino crept silently as a shadow down the smooth mountain face one barefoot moved a few inches and the toes touched in the stone and gripped and the other foot a few inches and then the palm of one hand a little downward and then the other hand until the whole body without seeming to move had moved. 
Kino's mouth was open so that even his breath would make no sound, for he knew that he was not invisible. If the watcher sensing movement looked at the dark place against the stone which was his body, he could see him. Kino must move so slowly he, could, he would not draw the watcher's eyes. It took him a long time to reach the bottom and to crouch behind a little dwarf palm. His heart thundered in his chest, and his hands and face were wet with sweat. He crouched and took great, slow, long breaths to calm himself. Only twenty feet separated him from his enemy now, and he tried to remember the grounds between. Was there any stone which might trip him up, trip him in the rush? He kneaded his legs against cramp and found against cramp, and found that his muscles were jerking after their long tension. And then he looked apprehensively to the east. The moon would rise in a few moments now, and he must attack before it rose to the dead of night. He could see the outline of the Watcher, but the sleeping men were below his vision. It was the Watcher Kina must find, must quickly and without hesitation. Silently he drew the amulet string over his shoulder and loosened the loop from the horn handle of his great knife. Ooh, he just took it from behind his back. Now he has it. What's going to happen? Warning, this is violent. This is like the Iliad. Um, it'll be gone quickly, but maybe you want to fast forward like a minute of this video. You have my permission if you do not like to read about this, which is totally understandable. Totally understandable. I'm not even joking with you. If you can do without the climactic ending. He was too late, for as he rose from his, his couch, the silver edge of the moon slipped above the eastern horizon and Kino sank back in, behind his bush. It was an old and ragged moon, but it threw hard light and hard shadow into the mountain cleft, and now Kino could see the seated figure of the watcher on the little beach beside the pool. The watcher gazed full at the moon, and then he lighted another cigarette, and the match illumined his dark face for a moment. There could be no waiting now. When the watcher turned his head, Kino must leap. His legs were as tight as wound springs. Think of a wound up spring. And then it just launches. And then from above came a little murmur, murmuring cry. The watcher turned his head to listen, and then he stood up. And one of the sleepers stirred on the ground and awakened and asked quietly, What is it? I don't know, said the watcher. It sounded like a cry, almost like a human, like a baby. The man who had been sleeping said, You can't tell. Some coyote, B word, it's a female dog, um, with a litter. I've heard a coyote pup cry like a baby. The sweat rolled in drops down Kino's forehead and fell into his eyes and burned them. The little cry came again, and the watcher looked up the side of the hill to the dark cave. Coyote, maybe, he said, and Kino heard the harsh click as he cocked the rifle. If it's a coyote, this will stop it, the watcher said as he raised his gun. Who's making that sound in the cave? Who could be crying loudly like a coyote? Kino was in mid-leap when the gun crashed and the barrel flash made a picture on his eyes. The great knife swung and crunched hollowly. It bit through neck and deep into chest, and Kino was a terrible machine now. He grasped the rifle even as he wrenched free his knife. His strength and his movement and his speed were a machine. He whirled and struck the head of the seated man like a melon. The third man scrabbled away like a crab, slipped into the pool, and then he began to cry, climb frantically to climb up the cliff where the water penciled down. His hands and feet threshed in the tangle of wild grapevine that he whimpered and gibbered as he tried to get up. But Kino had become as cold and deadly as steel. Deliberately, he threw the lever of the rifle, and then he raised the gun and aimed deliberately and fired. He saw his enemy tumble backward into the pool, and Kino strode to the water. In the moonlight, he could see the frantic, frightened eyes, and Kino aimed and fired between 
the eyes, and then Kino stood uncertainly. Something was wrong. Some signal was trying to get through to his brain. Tree frogs and cicadas were silent now, and then Kino's brain cleared from its red concentration, and he knew the sound, the keening, moaning, rising hysterical cry from the little cave in the side of the stone mountain, the cry of death. One note to make on this page here. When Kino goes on his rampage here, and it is a rampage, there's no mercy in this scene. Um, it's, it's disturbing and um, violent, to say the least. Um, the metaphors change. He is, up till now, defined by lots of animal uh, metaphors. And then the language changes to machinery. It says he's like a machine twice, it says that his legs are, are springs. Um, and then the third one, let's see, what was the third? Um, sorry. There was one more, uh, oh, deadly as steel. So this is what he's being compared to. Steel, machine, machine, and springs. So it becomes very mechanical all of a sudden rather than natural. And it could be saying something about this violence, that violence is not natural. That yes, there's a certain violence in nature that, um, that animals do to each other. But this sort of violence, it seems to be worse than natural is what Steinbeck could be saying with the change in metaphors, that uh, even what the animals do doesn't compare to this sort of rage that he's feeling, and maybe we should be more critical of what he's doing. Let's continue. Everyone in La Paz remembers the return of the family. There may be some old ones who saw it, but those whose fathers and whose grandfathers told it to them Remember it nevertheless. It is an event that happened to everyone. It was late in the golden afternoon when the first little boys ran hysterically in town and spread the word that Kino and Juana were coming back, and everyone hurried to see them. The sun was setting toward the western mountains, and the shadow on the ground were long, and perhaps that was what left the deep impression on those who saw them. The two came from the rutted country road into the city, and they were not walking in single file. Kino ahead and Wanda behind, as usual, but side by side. The sun was behind them, and their long shadows stalked ahead, and they seemed to carry two towers of darkness with them. Kino had a rifle across his arm, and Wana carried her shawl, like a sack over her shoulder, and in it was a small, limp, heavy bundle. The shawl was crusted with dried blood, and the bundle swayed a little as she walked. Her face was hard and lined and leathery with fatigue and with tightness and with which with which she fought fatigue. And her fatigue, by the way, means the next level of exhaustion. So you can be tired, and then if you're really tired, you become exhausted. And if you're exhausted for a long, long, long time, you hit fatigue, where it's just, I don't know how to get my energy back oftentimes associated with depression. Um, when, you, when Steinbeck notes the small, limp, heavy bundle, uh, that's your cue that the tracker's gunshot did go off a little too soon, that Kino is not able to interrupt the shot, and that Coyotito was a victim of this whole violent scene, um, that Coyotito did not survive. One of the um, ironies of this whole situation is that what do the trackers think that they're shooting? They think that they're shooting a coyote. What is the name of Kino's son? Coyotito. Coyote, Coyotito, the same name. Uh, Coyotito is just another way of saying little coyote. Um, so that's kind of a, oh, it's, it's, it's 
I want to say brilliant, but it's so sad that it's hard to use the word brilliant along with it. But it is tragic. That's the word I'm, I suppose I'm looking for. Um, and her, uh, her wide eyes stared inward on herself. She was as remote and as removed as heaven. Kino's lips were thin and his jaws tight, and the people say that he carried fear with him and that he was as dangerous as a rising storm. The people say that the two seemed to be removed from human experience, that they had gone through pain and had come out on the other side, that there was almost a magical protection about them, and that and those people who had rushed to see them crowded back and let them pass and did not speak to them. Kino and Wana walked through the city as though it were not there. Their eyes glanced neither right nor left, up nor down, but stared only straight ahead. Their legs moved a little jerkily, like um, like well-made wooden dolls, and they carried pillars of black fear about them. And as they walked through the stone and plaster city, brokers peered at them from barred windows, and servants put one eye to a slitted gate, and mothers turned the faces of their youngest children in, inward against their skirts. Kino and Wana strode side by side through the stone and plaster city and down among the brush houses, and the neighbors stood back and let them pass. Juan Tomas raised his hand in greeting, and did not say the greeting, and left his hand in the air for a moment uncertainly. In Kino's ears the song of the family was as fierce as a cry. He was immune and terrible and his song had become a battle cry. They trudged past the burned square where their house had been without even looking at it. They cleared the brush that edged the beach and picked their way down the shore toward the water. And they did not look toward Kino's broken canoe. And when they came to the water's edge, they stopped and stared out over the gulf. And then Kino laid the rifle down and he dug among his clothes and then he held the great pearl in his hand. He looked into its surface, and it was gray and ulcerous. Evil faces peered from it into his eyes, and he saw the light of burning. So ulcer is like a, an infection kind of to your body um, that you have to, it's causing your body great pain. So when he compares the pearl to this, it means that the pearl is causing him great pain, and he medically has to get it removed. <clears throat> um, evil faces peered from it into his eyes and he saw the light of burning and in the surface of the pearl he saw the frantic eyes of the man in the pool and in the surface of the pearl he saw Coyotito lying in the little cave with the top of his head shot away and the pearl was ugly it was gray like a malignant growth again another medical uh, metaphor of or simile of something that needs to be removed that is uh, hurting the body malignant that means if you have a tumor or something it would be it tumors are considered benign meaning they're not harming your body or malignant which means they're endangering your body and they need to be removed again and Kino heard the music of the pearl distorted and insane Kino's hand shook a little, and he turned slowly to Wana and held the pearl out to her. She stood beside him, still holding her dead bundle over her shoulder. She looked at the pearl in his hand for a moment, and then she looked into Kino's eyes and said softly, No, you. And Kino drew back his arm and flung the pearl with all his might. Kino and Wana watched it go, winking and glimmering under the setting sun. They saw the little splash in the distance, and they stood side by side, watching the place for a long time, and the pearl settled into the lovely green water and dropped toward the bottom. The waving branches of the algae called it to it and beckoned to it. The lights on its surface were green and lovely. It settled down to the sand bottom among the fern-like plants. Above the surface of the water was a green mirror. And the pearl lay on the floor of the sea. A crab scampering over the bottom raised a little cloud of sand, and when it settled, the pearl was gone. And the music of the pearl drifted to a whisper and disappeared.
Yes. Yes. Do you like it? The Pearl by John Steinbeck. You finished yet another novel here in Language 7. Um, this is tragedy, and tragedy works by um, not just telling you a sad story, though that's part of it, but tragedy also works through telling a sad story that did not have to be that way. Um, meaning all along this story, there's times when Kino is supposed to turn back and give up his passion, give up his quest, um, because it's not worth it. Juana says um, two or three times, at least, um, this isn't worth it, Kino. We should probably get rid of this. Then she tries to take it into her own hands, literally and run away and throw it into the water. And Kino gets enraged with her all until the end when he realizes that she was absolutely right and that it needs to be thrown into the water because nobody can handle that much wealth. Um, and that the systems of the world, the town and the city and the wilderness were not about to let him attain that wealth even if he did have the pearl in a just way. Um, so he doesn't take the options that he has to turn back. And that is what's tragic about this because he has to learn after it's too late. Um, why do people read tragedies? We're going to talk about this more next year in eighth grade. But one of the big reasons that people read sad stories is that they're able to open up their book or watch a sad movie and basically have a release of all these emotions when we read something like this. Um, that literature gives us, a, gives us permission to feel and to let out those emotions that we so often keep in. And we can empathize with these characters and we can place ourselves in their shoes and ask ourselves, what would we do? Or even a better question, what would we feel if we were in their position? Um, and then when you close the book, as we just did, you're left to think about those feelings and you're left to think, how can I go about my life in a different way? Um, how can I learn from this and empathize with people who have faced tragedy? Um, but also, how can I <laughs> maybe not be like Kino in that you actually listen to your partner or your parents, whoever that is, and avoid these horrible consequences of his own pride and his own, could you call it greed or just pursuit of money? This is going a few minutes over what we normally do. Um, but again, we will not have a video recording for tomorrow, which means during that time tomorrow, you need to be coming up with two questions of each level. So two level one, two level two, and two level three questions for our discussion of the end of the book on Friday's seminar. Okay. Um, I'll leave it at that. And I hope you got something out of this book and that maybe you even enjoyed reading it. All right. See you later.